Hi guys, welcome to part three of my Eagle Tree Vector setup videos. Now in part one we sorted out the transmitter and the receiver. We ran the RX analysis wizard which does a huge amount for setting up the vector. Um, that is to get the control sticks all working. As you can see there's a bit of movement when I move them around in the bottom left hand corner here. We also in part two then looked at the sub mode switches um, so the mode switch and the sub mode switch down here and we got all of these set up and talked about the various options that you've got. Now in this video, part three, I'm not really going to do a lot of setup specifically but what I'm going to do is a fairly long video just discussing all of the other options in the other screens at the top here. Now I'm not going to touch on the OSD at this point so if you're thinking that you'll get 20 minutes into this video and find me setting up an OSD then that's not going to be happening. That deserves a full new video with all of the detail that is involved in setting that up because there's lots of options. So in this video I'm going to talk about all of these tabs at the top, the airframe selection, the RC configuration, flight controller setup, compass and sensor setup, safety setup, I'm not going to bother with the support but basically I'm going to touch on all of the points that are in there some of them are advanced features and I'm not going to go into too much detail on them. The forums are a great place for it, but basically I'm just going to walk you through each one, talk about each one, and hopefully that will at least give you an idea, especially if you're not, um, not actually purchased one of these before. It should give you an idea of some of the stuff that you can look for in the flight controller once you've actually got it all up and installed. So let's move on with the first section. Okay, so let's take a look at the airframe selection screen. Nothing too complicated here. We've already actually used this. We've already selected the uh, traditional fixed wing for it. Obviously, this is the place that you're going to come to if you want to be um, using different types of models, if you're going to be using multi-rotor. And depending on the type of model that you're using, if you're using a multi-rotor, you get some different options than you do if you're using fixed wing. But anyway, all you need to do is just decide on the frame that you've got and, of course, the motor layout. You can see if you're using multi-rotors that you've got um, the clockwise and anti-clockwise rotations it tells you a bit about it and as you can see if you highlight over the top of any of these it tells you the motor configurations in the bottom right hand corner um, and what the various servos will do so we're using fixed wing so no problem there so moving on, we're going to go into the RC configuration screen. Now, the top of this screen will look very familiar because it is in fact exactly the same as the bottom half of the overview screen where you set up your transmitter. You can see I'm moving the sticks around now and things are moving about. This is where it confirms that the calibration is all done. And on the right hand side, you've got the mode switches and you can see the little slider here. If I flip my mode switch, it will go up and down. And likewise, my sub mode switch will go up and down and also it will confirm if I'm in failsafe, which I am in, in that mode there. Um, you've got your gain knob, everything like that. Like I say, nothing nothing particularly different about the top half of the screen. The bottom half of the screen is where all of the other options come in. Now, a lot of this gets set up as part of the RX um, analysis wizard, which we've already run. So all of these channels here that are mapped on these little drop-downs, that's already been um, pre-done by that and obviously the fact that we've chosen S plus etc so personally you, you can map these manually before you do the RX wizard but it does want you to do that so I would say run through that and if you want to make any changes afterwards that's where you can make those changes. Um, now on the left hand side here we've got the RX wizard you can see the RSSI at the moment is shown as 100% obviously depending on the ability for your receiver to give out RSSI will depend on what that's showing. Um, moving down to the bottom here we've got a fixed wing servo frame rate. Now this is a setting designed for people who are using purely digital servos. Um, it's set to 50 Hertz at the moment which is a standard kind of Hertz for analog servos but if you're using digital servos that have got much higher resolution you might want to actually play around with this I mean for example most digital servos are around the 400 Hertz range so that will give you a much higher resolution if you're using digital servos than it will do if you're using analog obviously you need to be very careful of not exceeding the manufacturers expectations on the servo um, so just be a bit careful of that look at the data that you've got from the manufacturer of your servo before you start fiddling. Um, under that you've got two options here. Now the first option is disable stick when in menu. Now what this means is that of course let's say you're flying your plane, you're flying around um, and then you decide actually I would like to change one of my settings. Maybe you're doing a long distance flight, you're running it in pretty much autopilot or return to home mode. Um, what you want to be able to do is go into the menu system 
whilst you're flying on your screen but of course when you press left and right what you don't want to do is find that your plane's rolling around all over the place so what this does is it says that when you enter the menu mo mode which is done by flicking your switch I think it's five times up and down um, when you go into that mode what it's going to do is it's going to say okay we're now in a menu make sure that when the flight sticks are being played with we don't operate anything from control surfaces. What it does do however and it's worth noting is that when you go into the menu it will place the plane into 2D flight mode with hold. So what that's going to do is that's going to hold altitude and it's going to hold heading. So if you are going to be adjusting your menu and you're flying away from you and you've got limited range make sure you don't spend too much time in there because your plane is just going to keep flying away from you. At the moment it's already defaulted as being on but you do have the option of turning it off so you can actually fly the plane whilst looking at your menu. The problem is with that is you're not going to be able to change any of the attributes in your menu anyway so it's fairly pointless. The one below it is in fact the one that actually says whether or not you can even get into the menu and at the moment it's defaulted to turned off. So as soon as it recognises that you are in flight, at the moment it's going to say, you know what, you can't get into the menu anyway. You can only do it once the plane's on the ground and you've got it under control. Personally, I would advise against trying to fiddle around with the menu unless you're an advanced pilot or you've got a really big plane that's got lots of flight time and a huge amount of distance because mm. it's going to be very, very easy to lose track of that plane if you're playing around with the menu settings. And also, you've got to bear in mind that any settings that you make could end up affecting the flight of that aircraft. Anyway, there are options for you if you want to use them. Uh, reverse second elevon uh, slash second VTAIL, that's a fairly obvious one if you're running those settings. Um, you've underneath it got an elevon center period which uh, allows you to change the center pulse, pulse width output of your receiver if it is not typical. Most people running modern receivers aren't going to even need to look at that. So moving over to the right here, as I've said before, this is where all the channels are mapped and you can see which ones they are. Now in the wizard, it maps the main channels, um, including the secondary ones for the sub-mode switches and things like that. However, there are some extra channels if you've got a receiver and a transmitter that have got enough channels in there that can be used. Um, the main ones that are worth looking at is there's a motor kill channel, so you can actually dedicate a channel to kill your motors off if you're in multi-rotor mode now why you'd want to do that I don't know the idea is that you have it so you can kill them on the ground but it also gives you the option of accidentally flipping a switch and suddenly your rotors fall out of the sky um, so it's available for you if you want to um, the other one that's uh, worth taking a note of is the RSSI um, if your receiver has a specific channel on the pulse train that is designed to output RSSI then this is where you need to select it because that means that it's not going to be using the SBUS to recognize the RSSI it's going to be using that dedicated channel. Um, other than that you can see below there's a map of all of them there's the number of channels in the pulse train all fairly straightforward. Moving over to the right we've got the selection whether you want traditional serial PPM or SBUS and then if you're using auxiliary inputs so Eagle Tree offer um, an RPM sensor, a temperature sensor, um, and a pitot tube. So they have the ability of basically saying that on your transmitter you want to select what your auxiliary output is going to be running. So if you have got one of them, you will plug it into there and it will tell the vector what actual um, device is plugged into that. Um, and other than that, underneath you've got this little box which is where it shows the information. So that covers the RC configuration. Um, if you do need to make any changes, then this is the place to do it. If all else fails and you get into a real bind, you can just choose to go back to factory reset, at which point you need to then select your airframe again and you need to run your RX analysis wizard and start off from scratch. Okay, so now let's take a look at the flight controller setup. Now, I'm not going to go into a massive amount of detail on this because a lot of it involves some of the advanced features for people who want to adjust gains and PIDs. And if you don't know what all of that's about at the moment, then you're definitely going to want to read up on it before you go any further with fiddling about with it in these settings. Um, the main thing, as you've seen already, is that there is a gains dial on a potentiometer that I've programmed. Um, the ideal of gains for fixed wing is going to be that if you turn that dial all the way down to nothing, Thing. basically the vector is doing nothing to help compensate for flying you're pretty much flying it manually when you dial it up into say 50% then it's telling you that 50%
compensation is being handled. That is to say that if you fly in a straight line and a big gust of wind comes across you, it's going to pick that up and say, whoa, hang on, we're, we're flying out of attitude here. We're going to put the attitude back into level flight. Now, if you put the gains too high, of course, it's going to react to any tiny little movement. So even if the plane is just fluttering because it's just in a tiny bit of turbulence, it's going to be trying to compensate against it. And what you have to bear in mind is if you overdo the gains, especially on fixed wing, what you'll find is the plane actually becomes unstable because it will be fighting its own compensation um, for every action there is an opposite and equal reaction that is to say that if it twitches it hard to the left inertia will move everything to the left when it then tries to compensate it back to the right inertia will move everything back to the right and you end up getting into this horrible state where the whole plane and airframe is vibrating your servos are working really hard you can't fly very well um, extreme circumstances you could find it fall out of the sky so anyway that that's just the basics of gains um, you can see at the moment they're all set to 50% up here. You can tweak these. I would advise personally, whatever you do, fly it first, see how it goes, use the potentiometer. If you don't like the way it flies, that's when to come back in here and potentially look at, um, at tweaking it. Likewise, there's, there's a bit of trim that you can do on pitch and roll. Again, I would advise fly it, see how it flies, use your trim tabs on your RX. Um, that's what they're there for and they do work and then you can come back in if you feel that something's really badly out you can take a look at making adjustments in here um, underneath it everything is greyed out underneath it now the reason is is that that is because this little click here show advanced gains and settings isn't done it's because they are all advanced settings um, and you know unless you're an experienced pilot and you really understand what they're doing it's a place that you don't want to be fiddling about with too much uh, again my advice read up on it talk about it go on the forums find out from people who have been playing around with it before you mess with it I'm not going to be messing with any of this personally the only things that I find are, are quite interesting um, when you go down to here the other advanced settings you've got a setting for example auto disarm on landing now if you've got a multi-rotor that's going to be quite important so when you land the thing it recognizes that you're on the ground that you haven't got any throttle input and it disarms the motors obviously means that you're saving a bit of battery and you're also not churning up a load of grass potentially if you've landed on grass um, you've also got auto disarm on flip crash now that's a very nice little feature that you've got and of course that that is relevant to both plane and multi-rotor so let's say you go in and the vector is upside down it will of course recognize as you can see in the top right hand corner the attitude so if it knows that brown is on top rather than blue and that there is no throttle input um, and that the, uh, the altitude on the um, on the barometer is at zero it knows that basically you've landed upside down so what it knows is that you don't want to have your motor banging away um, in the grass killing off your ESC so it will automatically disarm that which is a, a nice little feature there um, there's also um, a, um, a kind of a, a low medium and high setting which is for loiter mode and wind rejection so if you're using a multi-rotor and you want your loiter to be fixed in you know really nice and solid so when you click it into loiter it just stays where it is um, you can change how aggressive it is um, when it's being buffeted by wind and obviously if it's high winds you'd want it on high if you want it medium you know low wind um, what you've got to bear in mind is if you're trying to do photography through your multi-rotor and you have it on high that it's going to be vibrating and twitching all over the place um, because it's basically saying no I've been told I've got to stay here don't don't do anything to stop that it's also going to use up a little bit more battery life so just bear that in mind um, and on the right hand side here again this is something that actually could become quite useful if you do use loiter mode for fixed wing aircraft um, you can actually set the angles uh, maximum um, deflection uh, of the plane so if you're going into a loiter mode so let's just say you want to make some changes you can flick it into loiter mode um, the plane is going to be flying around it will take the GPS point that it's in at the time and it will be flying around that point now of course if you've got a plane that's not very stable above 35 degrees then you don't want it to go to, to above 35 degrees in bank angle um, so what it will do is it will follow your guide on here again my advice is get out in the field 
fly it, put it into loiter mode, be very, very careful, um, be ready to take over control if needs be, see how the plane flies. It should fly absolutely fine. Generally speaking, these settings are very, very safe. But if you do have aircraft that need a little bit more, um, more of a, a gentle curve, shall we say, then this is the section that you would go to. Um, in the multi-rotor settings over here, you've got the low battery auto land. So this is similar to the DJI mode um, that basically says it takes the number of volts per cell and if it drops below a certain amount, then it will say, you know what, I'm going to now auto land. The way it does that is it warns you by reducing the full throttle to 90%. So that is to say that if it gets into um, low battery mode, you'll know it because to sustain hover you'll have to have your throttle over 90 percent um, which of course in normal flight mode if you put it over 90 percent it would be shooting straight up into the sky um, once it goes under that and once you've reached these barriers 3.5 volts per cell as default then of course it's going to bring itself down so something to consider there and of course likewise idle throttle can be set um, with just a little slider here so um, have a read of that take a look at it like i say most of these things you're not going to be touching on um, and certainly for the first flight you don't want to play around with them um, the buttons at the bottom there are a couple that are quite important here you've got record flat level and you've got zero re zero gyros out of the box the vector gyros are already zeroed however if you knock it about if it's been bashed about a little bit if you've had a crash it's good to do a, a reset of the gyro you can do this in the field and it's important to know that you don't have to plug it in every time to do it I would say before you install it into your aircraft re-zero them keep it on flat level surface it doesn't actually have to be level um, but it needs to be completely still so I would say flat and level is best re-zero them it resets them all to default Record level flight, again, this is something that you can do in the field and it's something as part of the pre-flight checks that you're pretty much forced to do anyway. Um, and what that is to say is that if you've got a plane, you, you want to know that when you throw it into the 2D hold mode, that it's going to be flying straight and true. The way you actually do it is you hold the aircraft in that altitude, uh, in that attitude, sorry. So let's say you've got a Cessna with landing gear. Um, when it sits on the ground, of course, the nose is pointing up. So what you would do is you turn the plane on, you would plug it in, you'd hold the tail up so you've got it into the attitude that it's going to be flying straight and level. And at that point, you say, record flat level and then the vector knows that that's it. So there are all the settings on, on this particular um, page, like I say most of it isn't going to be used for, for beginners and many pilots from there on but all of those options are available and the forum is a great place to look for, um, for further tweaks on these. Okay, so let's move on and look at the comfort and sensor setup. Now, again, this is one of those places where you may not even need to be fiddling around with any of the settings in here. The one thing you need to be advised on is the enable magnetic compass setting. Um, this will be enabled if you've got a multi-rotor because you have to have the magnetic compass um, there. It's disabled as default on fixed wing aircraft because you don't actually need the magnetic part of the GPS to be flying. Um, however, it will increase the uh, accuracy. The reason that they don't enable it is because you've got to make sure that the GPS module is fitted well away from any magnetic interference, um, which isn't maybe as easy on a um, on a fixed wing as it is on the uh, multi-rotor setups. So you certainly don't want to mount it over the top of a, um, a motor that's got magnets spinning round and round and round. Um, Basically, if you do enable it, you'll see that you do get the instructions for compass calibration, standard compass calibration. This teaches you the, camp uh, the compass where magnetic north is. Um, you have to do it at least once um, to, to train it. A lot of people do it every time they fly. I personally would advise against that because you never know when you're going to suddenly find that you've removed a perfectly decent compass calibration and then you've caused problems because you're standing near a metal object or an underground metal object um, which throws it all out. So my advice on that is don't do it near anything metallic. Don't do it in your home. Um, get out into a nice big wide field. Do the compass calibration it will remember it and as long as you then don't go outside say 150 mile radius you shouldn't have to do that again it should remember it as long as you keep magnets away from the compass um, it should be absolutely fine um, a prime example my DJI Phantom I do it once um, in a big field I think I've only ever calibrated it a couple of times after that and that's because I was in a different country um, when I did 
calibrate every time. I ended up doing it once against a large metal building, um, and it caused havoc. It, it, the magnetic interference clearly made some some problems, and it was when I had an F450 spiraled out of control, crashed. You can watch the video on my channel. Um, but yeah, and that that I am of firm belief that that was because I recalibrated the compass while standing in an area that had magnetic interference. So just bear that in mind. Um, I'll disable that for the moment. Um, on the left hand side, you've got some um, fairly straightforward setting so minimum satellite count six as default um, h dop the lower the number the better the quality of the uh, the signal is actually horizontal dilution of precision which is the gps fix uh, they set it to 9.9 .9, so that's to say if it goes any higher than that then it will it will cause an error and it won't let you fly um, seconds to wait for post gps fix that is to say that if you're in an area that hasn't got great gps um, you could put the multi-rotor down for example you could wait for GPS fix it would find it it would lose it but because it's done that it will still let you fly so you can actually say hold a fix for a certain number of uh, seconds and likewise you can also say um, that you you want GPS fix before you can actually arm the motors um, voltage and current calibration now basically this is a multiplier so there are set default fun um, set default multipliers for how much drain to the voltage each of the equipment um, will do. This is voltage, not current, should be stated. Um, you can fiddle around with these. The, the key is basically is to get your get your aircraft um, loaded up, put a battery in it, see what the vector is is given us. And if we go over to the overview screen, you can see at the moment my present pack voltage is twelve point three nine to four zero. Now what you need to do is then get a multimeter um, and put that across your battery and make sure that what you're seeing here is the same as the battery if it isn't then this is where you can come in and you can tweak some factors now you can actually get quite complex with this so in other words it's assuming that your your camera voltage will have a certain um, draw now you can find out that actually that draw is slightly higher or lower so you can actually change the multiplier on that again my advice on this have a read of the manual Go to the forums, see whether or not people think it's absolutely necessary. Whether you know a GoPro has a bigger draw than um, a, uh, a Mobius. Um, whether you know whether you want to change any of those. I would leave it completely as default to begin with. Check your voltage. If you can see that, let's say I go into here and it says 12.39 if I put a multimeter across my battery and find out that actually it's 12.25 then I know that my vector thinks my battery's got more power in it than it actually has that's bad news because actually when the vector thinks it's running low it's run low um, and that's where you're going to have problems so that's the key you want to make sure that that is an accurate voltage um, there so play around with those um, you can also do a reset, of course, and then you've got the calculate true airspeed. Uh, airspeed. That's if you've got the, the um, pitot tube accessory, uh, zero spectrum flight logs once per minute. So if you're using a spectrum with a flight log on it, and then it will actually automatically do that. Um, and then use MAH for motor battery gauge. Um, that's uh, that's to say that if you don't want to use the MAH settings, then you can just remove that, and you can just have it as uh, as voltage. So that's basically it, like I say, a lot of these settings you're probably not going to want to worry about. Um, fly it, try it, see how it is, and then come back if you need to tweak it. Okay, let's move on to the final tab, which is the safety setup. And this is where you're going to do all of your return to home features. Now, the main options in the top under the basic safety mode settings, um, you've got three options, is none, land, and return to home. So if you have none, then if, uh, let's say, your transmitter loses its signal, then it's going to do nothing. If you've got it in return to home, then it's going to take the GPS point where you took off from, it's going to return, head towards it, and it's going to loiter over your head. The advanced features dictate how it does that, and we'll move on to that in a moment. If you choose land, all it's going to do is it's going to say, oh, I've lost signal, I am going to chop the throttle, and I'm going to glide myself down to the ground. Um, it will use a default uh, sync rate of 10 feet per second, which again, you can choose uh, in the advanced options, but it will take itself all the way to the ground, whether there be ground water, trees, houses, people, large events, etc. My advice, of course, on that is use return to home because one way or another it's better to try and get it towards you unless you're doing a really long-range flight and you know for a fact that you've just got open fields and nothing else. Um, 
You then got choose how the vector detects receive failsafe. Now this was something that happened in part one of the setup video as part of the analysis wizard for the RX. Basically it's saying that if SBUS connection is lost then put it into return to home. I have also got myself a test switch which is to say that if I put my mode switch into position 2 and my sub mode switch all the way down to position 3 that will activate return to home so I can do it manually if I want to. Basically the idea is that if my battery runs out in the transmitter or if um, if the signal is completely lost it says oh I can't see anything from my SBUS signal I'm going to put myself into return to home. Underneath that fairly obvious setting fly home at this altitude so that's just a very generic height that is to say that at 300 feet as default it will fly home at 300 feet and then it will loiter over your head once it gets back home. Automatic land at home that's actually for multi-rotors um, so that is to say that when you do a return to home in a multi-rotor just like a DJI model you can have it come home find a GPS point and actually land itself. Um, very useful if you've got the battery life but for fixed wing that's not going to be relevant to you. Then we've got some maximums, so we can actually say I don't want my plane to fly over the maximum altitude of, and obviously depending on your uh, rules for your um, FAA, CAA or any other aircraft um, organisation that controls the skies, you need to uh, be a little bit careful with that, I'll say no more on that subject. Um, then you've also got the maximum distance, so if you know for a fact that you're going to lose transmission after two kilometres, then you can set one and a half kilometres, or, or obviously in this feat, um, you can choose how far away your aircraft can go before it will actually turn around and come back to you. Very handy if you lose control method or if um, if something glitches out, so it may not actually say that your, uh, your receiver has lost signal but it might be getting a signal from somewhere else doing something completely different if that's the case then when it hits that barrier it will say no I'm not allowed to fly this way and it will come back towards you so underneath that you've got the advanced safety features now some of these are actually quite handy to look at unlike some of the other advanced features it's worthwhile just sort of dipping a toe into them if you want to use any of them you've got to click on the little tab there so we've got minimum ground speed. Now that is ground speed, not airspeed. So what that's saying is that whilst doing a return to home, what is your minimum ground speed for using cruise throttle setting? And in the setup video number one, as part of the wizard, it actually determined what the cruise setting was for your throttle. So basically this is to say that if you're cruising over a certain out, um, ground speed, it will be using cruise. If it drops below that it will start using climb so that's going to give it a good boost now for me I think I had about 40% for cruise speed and 80% for climb speed so if you do use this setting if, if the plane gets too slow then basically it will give it a good boost of, uh, of throttle but that can have of course you know varying results depending on what the, the situation is um, that you're flying at the time um, You've then got, for example, the desired climb rate. Now that is to say that if you're returning home and you've set an altitude for returning to home up here of 1,000 feet and you're flying at 300 feet, then the maximum climb rate to get to that 1,000 feet is going to be 5 feet per second. Um, if you've got a plane that stalls very easily, um, then you're going to want to set that a little bit lower so it does a nice slow ascent. If you've got a plane that you want to get up there really quickly, then you can set that a little bit higher. Exactly the same but in reverse for the sync rate, and I talked about this earlier, basically the when you're going to return to home, then the sync rate at the moment is um, 10 feet per second. Now if you've got a plane that is very very sensitive and you don't you know you think it might cause some problems to the airframe then you're going to want to set that nice and low. 10 feet per second is nothing really it's not going to suddenly do a vertical dive but you just have to bear in mind that, that it will come down at that rate. Now permit low altitude return to home um, they put a little caution on this what this means is that basically as default the vector won't allow you to throw your aircraft into return to home unless you are above 60 feet now if you are below 60 feet of course and you return it to home then you've got all sorts of obstacles that could be a problem um, so you can't basically do an autopilot landing at low altitude the reason they give you a warning is because it also means if you are below 60 feet zero is below 60 feet so if you accidentally flick it on and you've got the prop on there and you're fiddling around with it 
then all of a sudden it's going to say, oh, my GPS point's 10 feet away from here on the ground. I'm going to put myself into cruise speed, and your propeller's going to start spinning all on its own, um, and you're going to have a bad day if your arm's anywhere near it. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, the return to home loiter circle radius speaks for itself, really. Um, as you can see in the diagram up here, when you do come home on a fixed wing, it's going to loiter and circle around you. This is to give you that radius. So if you want it to fly in tight circles, you can decrease that. If you want it to fly in a nice big open circle, you can increase that. Bear in mind that the plane has to bank to actually achieve that circle. Now, the turn gain is part of that. This basically tells the vector how aggressive it can be with the turn. So 60% is probably the equivalent of putting your aileron into a 60% movement to one side. Um, you don't want that to be, say, 90%, because that would say that if you put this down to a 20 feet circle radius and you put that up to 90, that your plane would be doing incredibly steep banks and probably fall out of the sky. So just be sensible with it. Again, my advice as it has been all the way through this, try it, fly it, and then come back and tweak it if you feel that it's not right for you. Okay, moving on to the final options over here. You've got the home, um, re return to home altitude. So what this does basically is this says that when you're over a certain distance away from you fly at one altitude and when you get back near you fly at another now if you're doing long range flying this is quite handy because when you're doing long range flight you might want to be you know a thousand feet plus in the air maybe even more than that by doing that you know that you're avoiding anything on the ground big buildings um, mountains whatever it may be however when you return to home and you want to be able to land the thing, if you've lost video transmission, for example, you're going to want to be able to see it. So what you can then do is you can say that using these, if you set a 600 foot radius, what that is to say is that when that plane at 1,000 feet comes within 600 feet radius of you, what it will do is it will drop itself down to this desired altitude, and that will hopefully then bring it down to a place where you can actually see it by line of sight, you can then gather control of it and you can do the landing that, that you uh, that you need to do rather than it being at a thousand feet plus up in the air where you can't actually see the thing. Um, and then underneath that the um, the options for uh, the failsafe support, yes most um, receivers do have failsafe report these days, some of them don't, um, it's defaulted to yes. Disable failsafe RX glitches, this is for older um, older receivers that can glitch out and you'll actually get a warning on the vector whilst you're flying it that there is some glitching going on. If that's the case then you're going to want to go in here and say disable failsafe RX glitch detection. Um, so just be aware if you do get those warnings you might have to come into here. Um, and then you've finally got the return to home cruise throttle position. Now this is the position that we set in the RX wizard in the first video. So if we just look we've got 1382 so 1382 if I go into overview and we go down here to throttle. If I move my throttle up, one, three, eight, two, roughly about there, that is my cruise speed. So if you want to change that after you've done the initial setup, you can actually put this up a little bit higher. So if I felt for whatever reason that when I'm flying that this throttle position doesn't give me a, a solid cruise speed and my aircraft determines that it needs more or maybe it needs less to actually stay in flight then you can come into the safety mode and you can actually tweak that and that will set the cruise speed that it flies when it's coming home to you and that's the basics of the safety setup okay so that is an overview of all the main settings that are available through the software um, sorry it's been a bit of a long-winded one no doubt people have fallen asleep tuned out whatever but hopefully there's a bit of informa information in there that will at least give people the ability to see what's available um, my next videos are going to be about the OSD and setting them up um, so that is from these menus here um, just a brief overview to begin with as you can see here there's loads of options it gives you places you can move places around you can choose what is on screen what isn't so I'm going to go into all of these in a bit more detail so you can see the sort of functions and features that are available there um, after that I'm going to go through the actual setup using the transmitter um, menu so that's actually using the OSD so what I'll be doing is actually recording a screenshot from my screen um, whilst I'm doing that as if we were in the field um, and then obviously it's going to be a case of getting it inside an aircraft and getting some flight time with it which hopefully will be done once the weather improves but um, still a few more videos to do 
thank you for being patient. I will get them out as soon as I possibly can. Hopefully these have been useful and uh, I appreciate you watching. Obviously if you want to see any more of them, please subscribe.